You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast. Dr. Garbis, welcome to the Nailed It Ortho podcast. We are happy to have you on. So welcome. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Yeah, and this is a little different type of episode. It's different than our normal, you know, femoral neck or intertrochanteric fractures. We're actually going to talk about something that we don't necessarily learn in residency too often or isn't really talked about as much until, you know, you're in fellowship or about to start in practice when you're like, oh, okay, maybe I should pay attention to this stuff. Um, But we're going to talk a little bit about billing and coding today, especially, you know, in particular for orthopedics, which most people, almost everybody listens to this is... Uh, is an orthopedist or will be an orthopedist. So um, I am looking forward to this talk. No, this is a pretty, uh, you know, a topic that's uh, a little bit on the dry side. We'll try to make it as, uh, as interesting as we can and just cover, uh, I think, uh, what would be valuable for a uh, resident and uh, potentially fellow level. And, uh, and obviously, you know, if there's any concerns, you know, or, or questions, we can, uh, we can kind of go over things a little bit more in detail. Yeah. And typically what we do is we start off the episode kind of just asking a couple of questions to get to know you, and then we will hop into the topic of the day. So, you know, first thing is, um, Dr. Garbies, what, just looking back at it now, you know, now that you are, you know, you're in your attending position, you've been practicing, practicing for a little while now, and I know you did your fellowship uh, at John Hopkins, and, you know, shoulder and elbow. And looking back at it now, what are some of the things that, or maybe one or two things that you think you took away from that year of fellowship that you necessarily, may, I don't know if it's something that you maybe weren't expecting to take away, but, you know, some things that, that you keep with you. You know, uh, I think uh, one of the, th- the, the thing that I took away from fellowship, I think the most would be that, uh, that you really, uh, you really uh, should continue to cultivate that bond you you made with your fellowship mentors. I mean, these guys are um, these guys are, are usually out there and they, and they want to see you succeed. Uh, and uh, to not be afraid to uh, to leverage them. I mean, they're I think uh, I think the uh, first couple uh, months of practice, uh, I I didn't realize how many times I would be reaching back out to my fellowship guys uh, to ask them questions about routine things that I, I thought I potentially would be ready for. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, you know, you are ready, but you just uh, could use that extra little bit of reassurance. So I think having a little bit of that support and, and that uh, comfort, being able to reach out to your fellowship directors and make sure you sort of cultivate that relationship if you can, uh, was huge. So that was, uh, I think, uh, probably the most important thing I, um, I pulled out of my fellowship there. Yeah. And is it, is it definitely things like, um, you know, is it more technical or not, not office things? Is it more like, um, you know, office or uh, management type things or more like, Hey, I have this case. What would you like kind of getting their input? Like what are, is that kind of the, the, what you're asking or, you know, kind of the questions that you, that you had the, you know, when you first started off? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting when, when you're, when you're basically, um, working in, in like a fellowship or even like in a residency and, uh, and, and you see the patients that come in, you see them. Uh, but then when they're, when they're your patients, they're like, okay, well, do I see this person back in four weeks? Do I see them back in six weeks? Do I see them more frequently? Do I get an x-ray at every visit? And, uh, and, and, you know, obviously you're going to default to a lot of the things that you, you did as a resident and the fellow. Uh, but sometimes you, you just want to ask and be like, Hey, how do you think I should set this up? Or, Hey, you know, I, we, we did it this way. In fellowship, and I and I and I realized that you know I can't do it this way here because of you know the way my office is set up, or because of the way my practice is set up, or because of the way scheduling is set up. So, do you have any thoughts on how I can uh, do it differently? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's something that um, I think is definitely good to have somebody that you can reach out to in those situations. So, solid advice, and you know, things to keep in. Um, keep in mind for those that are entering fellowship or just about to finish fellowship. And that kind of blends in with the next question I was going to ask you. I was going to ask if there's any advice that you would give to new fellows this year. Um, But since we just somewhat covered it, is there looking back at it and, you know, looking back at your residency, is there any advice that you would give to yourself having completed through residency, um, any advice that you would give to yourself, you know, knowing where you're at now, you know, anything you'd say, um, to yourself when you were an intern or, you know, a second or third year? 
You know, I probably uh, I probably would have told myself just in, uh, I to just toward especially towards the end of residency. Uh, it also depends kind of what uh, you know how they do the match and stuff. Uh, towards the end of residency, it's pretty easy to like you know kind of go through the motions and kind of get through your rotations. Uh, but then you know what what I, what I realized from just talking to like a couple of my uh, my friends and colleagues uh, is is you know you're not always sure what uh, what the future is going to going to bring you. You know you're 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 not you know you're going to go into say let's say shoulder and elbow but you know you may not end up practicing primarily as a shoulder and elbow surgeon if you you know can't necessarily find a, a job for what you want to do I mean eventually you might be able to get there but uh, what I what I tell uh, what I've been telling most people and uh, and you know I, I sort of was fortunate in that I landed in a job that was a very subspecialized uh, at least was, that's what I wanted but uh, what I tell most people is um, is, is you know you don't know. Uh, whether you're going to end up in that sort of job or not, uh, and to pay attention to the the cases that you know you think you still might be able to do when you're out there in practice or should be doing, and to maybe keep a mental note of tips and tricks in those particular cases, even though you know you might be going into say, you know, foot and ankle, you still want to know all the all the tricks that sort of you know uh, retrograde nail a femur and and you know do you know do tibial simple tibial plateaus and stuff like that because again you don't know necessarily where your practice is going to take you so um so that'd be just just keep um try as you get uh, more like accepted in the fellowship try not to pigeon your hole yourself into like really only paying attention to stuff that is pertinent to your fellowship because you will learn that in fellowship it's all the other stuff that you won't learn in fellowship and you don't really get to go back and do that again until it's, it's you doing solid it. yeah yeah solid advice you know um uh, it, we've had some similar advice pretty much saying, you know, don't try to see every case you can, you know, try to take notes and learn from, you know, at least every service that you go on, there's always something just like you said that, that it may be your only time that you get exposed to foot and ankle, you know, and, and then, you know, you start practice and you may have something that makes you call on your foot and ankle days and, you know, use a technique that you learn. So solid advice again. And lastly, do you have any interest outside of the field of orthopedic surgery? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you gotta you gotta have hobbies. You gotta have other interests outside just work. So um, I like I like eating. I like going to nice restaurants. Uh, I I'm also a little bit of a car guy, and that's probably what I would call my uh, my main hobby. Uh, like to nice. like to wrench on them, like to drive them. Uh, you know, so I, I'm a little bit of a car guy. Do you go to the tracks? Do you go to the, the, the race tracks and drive cars there? Or are you just more, you know, you like to, you know, I know you just say you like to work on cars, but are you like a racetrack guy or what, what kind of the car show or what, what do you, what do you like to do? Well, um, you know, give, given the fact that I live in the Chicago suburbs and it's, it's horribly flat and absolutely boring. It's just a bunch of straight lines <laughs> in terms of driving. Um, you know, I, I, when I, when I, started when I was more like, you know, in high school, that sort of thing, it was sort of like, you know, drag racing type thing that would take, uh, take the car to the track every once in a while. Uh, and then, uh, and then, you know, later on, I, uh, I, I would take the cars to, uh, to more like road tracks, uh, which are kind of fun. Um, and, uh, and that's actually, that's actually a lot of fun in a, in a controlled environment. So, uh, so it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good times. Well, look, if you want some more interesting roads, you can always come down to New Orleans. We have lots of curbs and, and lots of turns and potholes. It, it, I'm telling you, it's very interesting <laughs> if you're tired of the uh, straight straight roads. Uh, Sounds awesome. <laughs> all right, cool. Well, let's go ahead and, and switch topics and uh, kind of get back into coding slash billing. Uh, now, now in your in your head, why do you think, you know, why is this important? Why do residents or fellows or may, there may be even be some, you know, junior attendings listening to this why is this something that you know that's important that they should you know pay attention to well i mean you know uh, obviously the, the the way most systems are working um they're they're looking at your um, it's either your your an rvu based and we'll get into the uh we'll get into the definitions of that a little bit later but uh, but basically there's there's these are all things that are sort of looking at your productivity and and you know obviously part of the way you get paid your practice gets paid your hospital gets paid um um, has to do with uh, with appropriately reporting um, uh, these codes and these diagnoses. So, uh, and uh, again, depending on your practice setting, you may have lots of support. You may have a, like somebody who works like as a professional coder that like does a lot of this stuff for you. And you may have very little support where you're basically doing uh, doing it all, all on your own. So um, I think, uh, again, it kind of goes to that, um, 
you know, a little, a little thing we mentioned earlier where you're going to have a little bit of uncertainty sometimes in terms of what exactly your practice setup is going to be and what it's, and uh, what kind of support you're going to have and what you have to do on your own versus not. So I think it's very helpful to at least have an idea. I mean, there's a lot of resources out there, which we can get into on like, you know, where you can find more stuff. Uh, but there's a lot of resources that, that you can uh, leverage to sort of figure out how you're doing things. Um, and, and it's a little bit of a learn as you go, uh, but, uh, but it does help, particularly as you get into the more senior levels of residency, to start paying a little bit of attention to how these things are. And, and you know, as residents, I mean, you guys are doing ACGME case logs, so you're, you're still doing, you're actually sort of doing it a little bit anyway. Uh, so you do get some exposure there, but really, uh, it, you don't have a ton of guidance as to how, you know, the way you guys would code for your case logs. It may not necessarily be the way that you would necessarily bill for certain cases. Right. And then this is important no matter what, like no matter if you're going to academics or private, either way, in order to get paid, you got to you have to know coding and you have to know billing, you know, no matter what, pretty much. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, again, I think it's something that if you work on or at least you try to learn a little bit earlier then hopefully by the time that you finish through, you can um, you can, you yeah, know, you be well versed in it. Um, I know there's there's always a bunch of different terms and things thrown around in coding, you know, especially, you know, if I'm going to book a case in Epic and I was there's always like, what code is this? Or if you're at the VA, they make you choose all these different codes and numbers and abbreviations and letters. Uh, can you kind of go through, you know, just some basic terminology and definitions that we should know for coding? Uh, absolutely. So, so basically, um, you're going to hear a couple different uh, abbreviations and uh, and terms that are thrown around as we as we start talking it helps to get a little bit of a definition of, uh, of what these things are uh, i think you know first first and foremost is the um the actual diagnosis code like so so you know you want to signify to somebody that um, that you know this person has arthritis of like the shoulder or arthritis of the hip or tennis elbow or you know they had an injury you know when they fell off the monkey bars there's a code for that um, you know, there's a code for like shark attack. You can get uh, you can get pretty pretty darn specific. Uh, yeah. So uh, that what what we're referring to when we talk about the the diagnosis, for the most part, is the international classification of diseases. You probably hear, hear, have heard it as ICD. Now um, now you know you guys who are you know residents now, uh, you probably got a little bit of the transition at the very beginning uh, from ICD nine because you probably still see those codes written. The ICD-10. Uh, so we just recently uh, kind of adopted here uh, ICD-10. But the, what's ironic is ICD-10 has sort of been around for a long time uh, in Europe, and we've just been a little bit slow to adopt it here, uh, moving away from ICD-9. And, and, and ICD-11 is actually due to be released, uh, I think, in a year or two. Uh, and the, the people who release it is basically the World Health Organization. So this is truly like an international classification where you can you know, put like the code you have up on the screen, like M16.0, and that's going to mean bilateral primary hip arthritis, you know, here, it's going to mean that in Europe, too, if they have sort of the, if they're, you know, using ICD-10 as well. So like they, like the codes are actually will sort of um, transcend uh, borders and uh, continents and, and whatnot. So you can, you can truly have like um, apple to apple type comparisons when you're, when you're looking at different diagnosis codes. So it's sort of up to you to accurately pick the right code for your patient to make sure that, you know, if you're going back and either looking at them retrospectively uh, or there's some part of some sort of database or that sort of thing that you're, that you're coding things appropriately. So if you have, for example, you know, multiple issues, say you have a torn rotator cuff, but then you actually, you also have, you know, biceps tendonitis and you, you have, you know, um, uh, subacromial impingement or something like that. Do you have to put all those different diagnoses or is this the one where you have like one primary diagnosis and then you have all these other different ones? Well, you know, in, in general, uh, and, and we'll get to it when it comes to sort of like, you know, looking at complexity and that sort of thing. I, I try to put as many kind of specific diagnoses as I can. I mean, you know, sometimes Sometimes you have a patient that comes in and, uh, you know, they're, they sort of got something, you know, non-specific shoulder pain. You don't have an MRI. You're not sure whether it's like a rotator cuff problem or whether it's like a biceps problem. Uh, and you're, you're overall calling it some sort of, you know, waste basket like a tendinopathy or a tendinitis or something. There's more like generalized codes you can use, like, you know, disorder of verse eight in the shoulder, which is like a generalized code. But as you start to get, you know, a little bit more specific, like, you know, they have like a torn rotator cuff, you pick like complete rupture of rotator cuff, 
you know they have a bicep problem, I would pick that. You know they have stiffness, you pick adhesive capsulitis. Their AC joint uh, is problematic, I would pick you know primary localized arthritis of the shoulder. And I would try to sort of make things a little bit more specific, so then then you can uh, you'll capture these these people moving forward. Yeah, and I'd imagine this. You know, if you're at an institution that does research, I'd imagine having the accurate diagnoses. You know, down to you know biceps tent, like you know frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis. I'd imagine that that would make it easier to you know go back and review however many patients you want to you know review with that certain condition because you can just look up that code. If that if this is how it works, this is me in my head imagining it, but I assume that would make it a little bit easier. Absolutely, and and you know, yeah, like I said, every place is different. You know, and you may you may have like a different database, or if you can have different, like like a different patient report outcome system uh, at whatever facility it might be. I mean, it might be a little bit easier to capture that data, but in some places, uh, you know, I know with us, you're basically um, you're basically looking at either you know ICD-10 or ICD-9 code um, because you know for for a while we were using that up until a few years ago. Uh, and then CPT. So you know that basically everybody that you've done a, you know, ORIF of a clavicle is by, you know, by definition going to have some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of like, you know, ICD that's going to support a clavicle fracture probably, right? So you can look them up by CPT code. And, and what the CPT code is basically a number that signifies a type of case. So, you know, if you've done a number that, uh, that means, you know, this is me fixing a clavicle, you can presume they're going to have a clavicle fracture, and then you can look at their um, you know, you can look at their notes or x-rays or whatever more specifically to then, to then see if they fit whatever criteria you're looking for. So you're either, for most of these people, you're either looking them up by their diagnosis code that you or somebody else has put in, or you're looking them up by the code um, for the type of surgery they had, uh, in which case uh, that's also something you, you or your coders have put in, uh, and then sort of working backwards to, to see if they fit your diagnosis. So it's not the, the best system, but, uh, but I mean, it's kind of how it works at many places. So that, that CPT code, that I know it stands for current procedural terminology. Those are the codes that when, for example, residents, when we are logging cases, those are the codes that we're using. Is that, is that correct? Correct. So, you know, those, those five digit codes that, uh, that residents are using to put in their case logs, those are CPT codes. So basically those are isolated separate codes for different procedures. And each procedure has its own code. Uh, and each procedure comes with a different RVU value attached to it. And in general, there's something that when you look at it, it's important to pick the right one. So you put, uh, you put an example on the right. So the, you know, the 23460, so that basically is a code for an open uh, capsule or for your basically like an open stabilization surgery uh, with, uh, with a bone block. And, and what that bone block is, is you could be like iliac crest or something like that. Um, and um, and then when you go to uh, 23462, that's basically the same uh, uh, type of surgery, capsule or anterior, any type uh, with coracoid process transfer. So what that means is you're adding the ladder J type procedure or Bristow type procedure uh, to that case. And, and interestingly enough, when you look at most of these codes, uh, it's, not, it's not like uh, you know, 100%, but if you sort of look at like you know, the way they have them laid out, so 23462 is likely to, uh, to be worth more um, uh, value um, in terms of physician work. And we can kind of get to the you know, more details of that, those definitions down the line. But, but as the numbers go up, they tend to be um, usually like a little bit higher physician value within the same sort of like um, surgery. And then when you kind of go to like a different type of surgery, it sort of resets with the lower numbers, like the zeros being a little bit lower value. And then as you go higher, the higher numbers a little bit more. Okay. So the ICD-10 code is going to be the diagnosis. The CBT code is going to be the, the procedure. So uh, what, are the, what are the, I always hear this term, you know, thrown around a lot. What is RVU and, and what does that mean? Can you kind of break that down to us? Yeah, so the RVU is relative value unit. So basically, it's a way for uh, people across all specialties. I mean, pretty much everybody uses RVUs um, to keep track of um, the amount of physician work slash practice uh, work that uh, that is being done. So each procedure pays a certain amount of um, of, of RVU, uh, and they and they uh, basically uh, each one of these has like a standard, uh, you know payment from like Medicare. So you know, Medicare was paying like $36 and then the, you know, the move is down to like 32 uh, with some of the recent stuff that they've switched around. Um, and, uh, and we'll get a little bit into that uh, a little bit later, but there were some changes kind of the beginning of January in terms of uh, some of the outpatient codes. 
Um, and uh, and basically, when you look at look at it, the the RVU, it's divided into a couple different subsets. So there's the work RVU, which is basically about half of it, about 50 to 55 percent of the RVU uh, is uh, is work RVU. So what that work RVU is is essentially physician physician work, uh, and that work RVU. Uh, uh, is basically like the physician's part, so the person doing uh, the procedure. And then there's part of the RVU, the PE RVU, is like the practice expense RVU. So that that other half of it is pretty much uh, belongs to like, or is, is intended to cover like the practice, uh, practice expenses and overhead and that sort of thing. And then usually about 5% of it is, uh, is like a malpractice portion of it, which is meant to cover, you know, malpractice uh, insurance. And then, and then those RVUs are basically adjusted for like geographic region. So if you're like in a very high uh, area that has like a high cost of living, uh, sometimes they'll they'll adjust um, the compensation per RVU to be a little bit higher than if you're somewhere that has like a very low cost of living. So say like these different divided RVUs, right? So say, I'm, I'm just throwing an example out to see if I get it and I probably don't, but we'll see. Uh, so say for example, I, am in a private practice and for some reason I, I put on an X fix. So is the work RVU the is that how much the insurance company is, is paying me for putting on the X fix and then the practice, you know, the PE RVU is do they pay a portion to the practice like you know that I'm under itself? Is that how is that kind of how that's how that's working out? Or am I am I thinking of that in the right way? Yeah, well, and part of that part of that also, you know, depends. Like, um, part of that also depends kind of how how you're set up, right? So, like in uh, like if you're doing this if you're doing this thing like at your 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 own service center, like you know that your your practice has, basically, you know, the whole the whole sum is going to go to your service center since you are the practice and the provider, and you pay your own malpractice, right? Uh, so that that pretty much if you sort of control your own service center, that pretty much will come to your practice, right? And it'll be all together. Now say you're doing this at like a hospital that you don't own, like part of that, the part, the work RVU is basically going to be like the part that's sort of allotted to you, like your collections, if you've heard that term, like that, that part is going to go to you. Uh, and then the hospital is going to get, uh, is going to get, uh, you know, sort of their, their cut of it as well. Okay. So say, for example, like, is a hundred like out of, I'm just throwing a number out here. So the RVUs for X for this case is going to be a hundred RVUs. For example, you may get 75 RVUs for being a surgeon new in the case. The practice expense or the hospital may get 20 RVUs and then malpractice you know, five may go to that. Is that like I know the numbers are may not be hundred percent right, but is that kind of the way to think about it? Yeah, and, and usually and usually the numbers overall just sort of think about it is, is about half. It, it's usually pretty pretty steady, like you know half of it for the most part uh, is going to uh, to the physician, and the other half is sort of split between the practice expense uh, with the uh, malpractice being like you know five percent of it. So, uh, so yeah, that's that's a pretty good way to think about it. But you know if you're doing hundred RVU X fixes, tell me your secret, brother, because I, I want to know. <laughs> uh, just throwing that out there. And, and so, is there um, is there a special committee or, or people who who comes up with this RVU unit? How do they assign it to you know an X fix versus a tibial nail versus et cetera? Yeah, so another another term may here thrown around is the RUC, the R-U-C, which is the Relative Value Scale Update Committee. So these are these are uh, I think it's about 29 or 30 people that basically have um, uh, have a say in terms of like how you adjust uh, you know how you adjust numbers up and down. So uh, you know when you know total hips used to take you know three hours and and whatever. Uh, you know, there would be a thought that maybe the RVU is uh, RVU value needs to be higher. But then, as people start to see, hey, you know, you can do these cases very quick. You can, you know, do like uh, a ton of them in a day. Um, and you know, the average, if you look like the average amount of, you know, risk, and, and it's a couple different things. It's not just like you know how long it takes you to do the surgery, but it's like you know, uh, risk, morbidity, um, kind of uh, follow up, that sort of thing. Um, and and then they can sort of say, I, I don't think that you know, this case um, should be worth more than this case uh, when you look at, you know, what you're, um, when you look at what you're comparing and what you're, what you're doing. So there's a, there's a certain group that basically adjusts uh, up and down kind of the, the number. Now, the thing that's interesting with them is that they, um, 
they don't have a lot of leeway in terms of adding more. They can't just, you know, increase the value of everything. When they increase something, they sort of have to make, it's almost like property taxes. They almost have to uh, make like a commensurate decrease somewhere else. So, you know, if you, right. if you fight to get your property, property taxes uh, lowered, you know, some other, some other uh, guy is going to end up uh, paying a little bit more than, then eventually they might come get, come back and get you. So it's, uh, yeah. it's sort of that sort of thing. So they, they sort of have to, you know, take from someplace and, uh, and then maybe give it somewhere else. So they, they sort of shuffle it around. Okay. And one last thing is like for our, our views, for example, Medicare pays X amount, but then another insurance company may pay like 40 RVs per se, you know, this, it, it, it depends on insurance companies. Is that right? Absolutely. And it's almost, okay. and it depends on what contracts are negotiated with the hospital and what contracts are negotiated with your practice. You know, you might get somebody that says, you know, we pay 150% of Medicare. Uh, you may get somebody that says we pay, you know, 90% of Medicare. Not that that's that common, but uh, but you know, you, you, you can, it basically is the kind of contracts that, that are negotiated by either your practice, or your hospital system, um, that, that determine your percent and they, you know, most people, you know, they're, they're not obligated to follow Medicare, but because, you know, they Medicare and the government puts all this uh, work into getting this organized, they, they usually do and usually just make it as a multiplier to make it easy. Okay. And so, okay. So I guess it's moving forward, switching, you know, switching gears. Um, what can you can kind of talk about what bundling is? I know we talked about CBT codes, but I, I've heard the term bundling thrown around. Yeah, so so bundling is is basically um, just uh, it's just a way of saying that you know certain CBT codes include other parts of, C, of other CPT codes. So you know putting on there's a CPT code for putting on a short leg splint or long leg splint or, or um, you know something something like that, but uh, but you know. If you're if you're doing it in the setting of like a bigger surgery where that splint is sort of counting as the post-operative dressing as something you do routinely, um, then then you know it doesn't really count. You can't really you can't really put it together because it's part of the because it's bundled together usually. So unbundling, which is sort of the, the opposite side of that, is sort of breaking them up into different codes, and, and that can kind of land you in trouble if you're doing a lot if you're doing a lot of like unbundling and like you know trying to you know, say, oh, I'm going to do this and, you know, bill for the this and bill for that. But, you know, if all that stuff's included in part of the package, it's not really uh, allowed for you to do. And if you don't have a coder that's going to catch that, you'll probably land yourself into some trouble. Mm, okay. And and then what's E, e slash M? Yeah, so E, e slash M and, and what the way you hear more people talking about it, E and M uh, basically stands evaluation and management. So, so E and M is uh, basically a, a subset of uh, CPT or uh, the current procedural codes uh, that uh, that talk about you know outpatient evaluation for for the most part outpatient evaluation and management. Uh, you know at least in, in orthopedics. Um, so you basically uh, translate um, outpatient management to a CPT code. Um, and one other thing to keep in mind um, is uh, that you know in, in ortho. Fracture care, non-operative fracture care, like you know, closed treatment of like a greater uh, tuberosity fracture, or a closed uh, treatment of a shoulder dislocation without uh, maybe you know without uh, necessarily doing um, doing open surgery. Uh, still, that those actually have their own CPC as well, and those can sort of be included. Uh, and we could talk about things a little bit later in terms of how that um, how that plays out. But those can sort of be included um, in um, in your outpatient management, and uh, and those have a global period, which uh, which we'll get into in a little bit, uh, what that means, um, and uh, and those separate codes uh, can be sort of in addition or uh, sort of complementing your outpatient evaluation codes. Okay, and, and since you just mentioned it, can we can we touch on what a global period is? Yeah, so global period is basically a period of time after like a, a certain CPT code occurs. Uh, which includes all related care, including like office visits uh, and, and basically, you know, x-rays, cast changes, that sort of thing. So like, uh, you know, oftentimes you hear the common numbers are like zero, 10 and 90 days. If you do like a procedure, which is like uh, essentially very minor, uh, like, um, like say something like a toe amputation, like I think a toe amputation has like a zero day global period uh, where like, you know, you basically, you do the toe amputation and then, you know, the next day, if like the patient comes and sees you, uh, or next week, patient comes and sees you complaining about the the same toe. Uh, you know, at that point, you can sort of charge them for another like uh, outpatient uh, evaluation code, or like another, uh, hey, I saw them in the office, and you build a certain code. 
Uh, whereas like, you know, if I were to do like a, say a shoulder replacement, um, you know, those, those bigger surgeries have like a 90 day global period. So, uh, so basically I do shoulder replacement and then pretty much the patient could see me every week for three months. Uh, they could see me every day for three months. Uh, and, uh, and there's basically, that's no different than the patient who comes and sees me at one for po one post-op visit. Like the, it's literally the same compensation value. You aren't really charging for that. Uh, if the patient's coming in basically in relation to that surgery that they have. Ah, but if it was a new, if it was a new symptom or, or something like you did shoulder surgery, but now they're coming from their knee, that'd be something different versus if, you know, they're coming for their shoulder. Right. That's a perfect segue into the other term modifiers. So. Um, so basically, uh, if, if a patient comes in and, you know, you see it all the time, you know, I, I did their, I did their shoulder, you know, two and a half months prior and they come in saying, all right, you know, this side's going fine, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting a lot of pain in my, in my other shoulder. And like, you know, you see, you start seeing them for that, you know, they're technically still in the global period. So you're, you're technically not really charging an outpatient visit for them, but you know, if they are, uh, complaining of something else and you start evaluation of a different problem, then basically what you can do is you can sort of bill and then code, uh, for you seeing that different problem, but you use a modifier, which in this case is 24. Um, and, and, you know, knowing these, it's so, it's so not worth like starting to, to recognize them and, and remember them now because there's, there's so many of them, but, uh, but then, you know, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, systems, you know, like Epic or whatever coding system, uh, or whatever billing system you might use, um, it can sort of help you find these modifiers, uh, you know, when, when you, when you start looking around, but, uh, but you can use those basically when somebody's in the global period or, you know, reporting something during surgery, uh, that would be different than the normal or typical expected. Okay. And then new versus, you know, established when you're, you know, I, I see this all the time when I'm, you know, in Epic and seeing patients in the clinic, they have this whole, it's like you said on Epic, there's a modifier section. There's a, you know, a, a section where you either bill as a new three, one or two versus, you know, follow up. So can you kind of go over what new versus established means? Yeah. So a new patient is, uh, is somebody is, is new to you. If they haven't seen, uh, haven't been seen by any of your partners, basically, and, and you or any of your partners in the past year. So, you know, I saw a patient, let's say 2016, I did surgery on them. Uh, you know, I saw them basically in follow up until about 2017. They haven't showed up since then. And now it's 2021 and they show up at my door wanting to see me again uh, for the same problem. Uh, it, it becomes a new patient uh, because, you know, they haven't seen them in, in uh, three years. Now, you know, say they just saw, you know, one of my partners uh, a couple months prior, they're still established. Um, you know, the same thing goes if, uh, you know, my, my, one of my partners sends over a patient uh, to see me, uh, then, then th those patients, if they've been seen by my practice in the past few years, um, they count sort of as an established patient. Now, there is a little bit of a caveat. There's certain partners in like, especially orthopedic groups uh, where, where you're sort of under different codes. So like, you know, hand surgery has like their own special like uh, Medicare, like billing taxonomy uh, and, um, and like sports has their own and uh, hand has their own, but then a lot of the other ones are general. So like, you know, if a joints guys send me something uh, for me being a shoulder guy, uh, the joints guys send me something. It, it doesn't count uh, as a new patient. It's established, but like if the hand guys send me something, uh, because they're under like a different billing code, uh, then that can count as a new patient. It's kind of um, you know one of those little weird things that you, you pick up along the way, um, and it just matters in terms of like you know you, how how you're billing these patients. And then so what if like you know say if you work in a hospital system and. And somebody, you get a call, hey, you want you to guys to come and rule out septic, you know, septic arthritis or anything they have got or whatever it may be. But pretty much you see a consult in the hospital. Is there a way to code for those? Yeah, so those those are uh, you know, those are going to be inpatient consultation codes. And, uh, and those will be, and, and those will sort of be a little separate thing. And again, you know, depending on whatever system you're using, it's, it's relatively easy to look them up, but there's a certain subset of them. Uh, and, and basically what those codes sort of require is like when another provider requests your opinion regarding a patient. So you need to report, hey, the patient is being seen at the, requ the, quest, the request of, uh, you know, Dr. So-and-so. Um, and, uh, and then you're going to send Dr. So-and-so a letter uh, informing them of what your findings are. Uh, you know, you have, you, have, you can actually have outpatient consultations. Uh, there are outpatient consultation codes as well uh, in the office. And, and those are pretty much the same thing. Like, you know, somebody sends a patient specifically to your office to be seen for something. Uh, you see them, you, you evaluate them, and then you send that personal letter back. 
does that does that is that uh I don't want to say does it paint is it is it more compensation or is there any you know or is it just saying that hey this is just a console or this is somebody that you're consulted on so this is just how you go it's just something that just to know about no there's actually more RVUs associated with that because it's uh and you know Medicare doesn't really pay consultation codes I mean that's still a thing that like commercial insurance is doing um you know that that might go the way of uh being extinct you know if Medicare hasn't been doing it not doing it I mean that may go away at some point but. Uh, but what it is, it's, uh, it usually gets you uh, a little bit more percentage uh, because the, because there's the sort of the extra expense of like, you know, uh, you know sending a letter uh, slash uh, uh, communicating with somebody uh, kind of what your what your results are. So and, and that that is, um, but, you know, the way I think things have become like it's, it's pretty easy to just say, you know, CC so and so and like or like CC the chart to them. So I, I, yeah. I don't know that that's going to be. A thing for much longer if you're really looking at it objectively and then another you no know, another thing that you know i always hear about is mdm or, or medical decision making what does it have to do with you know billing slash coding yeah so your medical decision making is, is basically the components uh and then of the note the documentation that determine the the uh, complexity and sort of the corresponding um uh, the, the corresponding uh, rvu that you're going to pick um and uh sort of the corresponding level of service um, and uh, those components of the medical decision making um, have, have, you know, in the end, in the end, you know, for, for our purposes, you know, the, just because, you know, we hit January 1st and we had, you know, the way things have uh, changed with coding, uh, you know, practice is, is still the same, right? It's just a matter of uh, fr phraseology and in terms of how, uh, how people are keeping track of it. So, uh, yeah, no, that was a perfect segue, segue into, uh, so what has changed, you know, now we're in 2021 and, I actually think I have a grand rounds coming up talking about, you know, some of this coding changing stuff, but so what's changed this year? What's new in 2021 that that was new before? Yeah. So uh, this, this has to do mainly with coding ENM visits and a lot of, a lot of what it is, this is actually um, uh, making it a little bit, um, making it a little bit better uh, for um, making it a little bit better for um, some of the services that see a lot of like outpatient clinic. Uh, because uh, a lot, a lot of the way CPT has been uh, skewed has been skewed towards procedural lists. So people that do a lot of procedures um, tend to to get like uh, collect a higher number of RVUs for the most part, and uh, subsequently that uh, that kind of leads to higher compensation. And a lot of times the people who are, you know, pretty much working, uh, you know, as much as we like to tease our medicine colleagues. I mean, seeing a lot of clinic and doing a lot of stuff outpatient. I mean that that can be a lot. It can be very time consuming. It'd be a lot of work. Um, and, uh, and I think that the, the, um, the way the RVU system was set up, that sort of penalized them a little bit. So I think the people that saw a lot more clinic and did fewer procedures uh, with the way the E&M is going to be uh, this year, they've bumped up some of the numbers. Um, and, um, and then if you, if you sort of look at the procedure um, codes, those have pretty much stayed the same. And then what they've done is they've decreased the number per RVU uh, uh, in terms of the dollar compensation. So, so in effect, you're making the clinic visits worth a little bit more and the surgery is potentially worth a little bit less. And then if you, mm. uh, if you go and you look at your, uh, you know, what medical decision-making is, um, it's basically the taking an appropriate medical history and or examination, then adding it to, um, adding it to the, the medical decision-making that sort of gives you your level of complexity. Um, and, uh, and, you know, these, this is, this is the part of the, uh, um, of coding that gets a little bit tedious and a little bit dry, but I mean, I think it kind of helps to sort of talk in broad strokes about what this stuff is. And a lot of the, uh, a lot of the charts and, uh, graphs that, uh, that you have, uh, uh, on the, um, on the PowerPoint, uh, I sent you, uh, those are actually from the faculty of the American college of surgeons. And there's other resources that I can talk to you guys about, uh, yeah. in terms of being able to look this up too. Yeah, and yeah, we can. I mean, we can go through it. The uh, uh, you know, feel free to go go through whatever you, whatever you want to. You know, if you think it's uh, if you think it's important. I know we we're talking about the it's switched now, depending on I guess the, the complexity, and now it's kind of straightforward versus you know low complexity cases versus moderate complexity cases. And I guess what um what should we know about you know what should what are some things we should know about that. Yeah, what it what it used to be, uh, it sort of it sort of used to be like, um, you know, if you looked at the way things were prior to 2021, you had to have like a very specific, um, 
very specific, like, you know, uh, you almost had to like, uh, yeah, it was almost like, like, I don't want to say like playing like a video game, you had to like, you know, check certain boxes off and like jump through certain hoops to sort of like get to the next level, you know what I mean? So, uh, so basically to get to like a, um, yeah, there was basically uh, detailed history, then there was comprehensive history, there was like detailed examination and comprehensive examination, each one of those would have different criteria that you sort of had to fill. And based on the number of those, uh, you know, for a new patient, you had to basically fill like three of three. So, you know, you had to have a comprehensive history examination and complex decision making for like uh, level three. It just had to be detailed. And for there even used to be like a level one code, but you know, almost nobody used it. And it was so such like a low acuity code that they actually just got rid of it for 2021. So what they've sort of switched over the phraseology to be at this point would be medically appropriate uh, history and physical. So, you know, you don't necessarily need to um, get a bunch of like, you know, checkpoints, but if you're doing what's appropriate, so like if you run and do all the tests for like somebody that has like a, um, you know, say hip arthritis, so you're checking their, you know, you're checking their plantar flexion strength, you're checking their hip range of motion, you're checking if they have internal rotation contracture, you're checking to see if their knee functions appropriately, you're checking their gait, uh, you're checking a deep tendon reflex, that sort of thing. Uh, and then you basically talk to them about the, their course of, uh, of treatment. Uh, and you, that is a medically appropriate history uh, for, for all codes. They've sort of made it a little bit uh, more lenient in terms of people not trying to like, basically trying to, uh, just check off a bunch of boxes so they can, you know, sort of meet the, the level of like that next code. And, uh, and then if you look at the, the way that the difference is, like if you look at like a, an outpatient office visit, which is like a new patient visit, uh, which is like a, let's say like a level three, which tends to be a pretty common uh, visit, uh, that was worth like 1.4 to work RVUs. And then with the proposed change uh, for, um, for 2021, that the change has gone up to, uh, is basically like 1.6, and that's uh, you know a lot of these have gotten bumped up um, a, a fair amount, uh, you know 12%. Uh, if you look at some of the established visit codes, I mean those got bumped up significantly. Like you know like uh, the the level three uh, outpatient visit, which is pretty common, uh, got bumped up to like a 34, got bumped up about 34%. So uh, that's that's a that's a pretty big jump. So you can see people that see a lot of clinic uh, can definitely see that. Um, uh, translating it to more of a use for them at the end of the year. And for example, like say, you know, I'm just using round numbers, say Medicaid or Medicare pays 30 RVUs. Um, and so this is 0.97 RVUs. So you see that patient roughly say they get around 30 bucks, but now if it's 1.3, say they now might get like 40 bucks per se for that, you know, patient encounter. Is that, that's kind of the, what we're looking at, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So so then that, that that kind of will translate into like a um, basically higher dollar amount for that that particular encounter, depending on the the payer. So what things of the medical decision making should we you know look at? Like what are the, the elements that we need to include in you know in our notes uh, for you know proper billing and coding? Right. So, uh, so basically you're, you're looking at, uh, you know, the first one is like the problems addressed. So basically if you have somebody coming in and, uh, you're, you're an orthopedist and they start, to, they start to, uh, say, you know what, uh, uh, they're complaining of, you know, left hip pain, right wrist pain, hand numbness, uh, pain in their neck, uh, you know, so and so and so, and they're, they're, they're basically, you know, giving you like a bunch of different problems that that sort of is like one of the first elements that, uh, that, that basically, um, um, you know, you're, you're sort of going over those problems and kind of addressing those problems. So having like a, like a higher number of those um, can, uh, can sort of uh, increase the complexity of your visit. Uh, kind of moving into the second one, the data reviewed and analyzed. So this basically counts for like the amount of complexity of data to be reviewed and analyzed. So uh, each test order or document basically uh, can, can sort of meet, help you meet certain levels of medical decision making. So you, know, you definitely have a patient that like, so let's say they, they'll they bring an example. They, they come in and uh, you pull up an x-ray and you personally review the x-ray because you look at it, right? And you see right. a very clear, like a very clear electron fracture. Uh, you're like, all right, you have an electron fracture. Um, let's fix it. That's pretty simple, right? They came in, they had an injury, elbow pain. Um, you know, you reviewed one 
um, one uh, sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and then your, your diagnosis, your medical decision making, which we'll get into the next component in a minute, is you're going to say, we're going to fix it and do surgery. Whereas you have somebody else and they, they come in and, you know, they have, you know, they've been to 16 different hospitals. They come in with a giant stack of like, you know, outside records. Uh, <laughs> they bring in six and you've been there, right? They bring in, yeah. six pieces. <laughs> they're loading in, you're, you're, they're coming in for your, their knee and they're loading like six, 16 uh, CDs full of like, you know, chest, abdomen, pelvis uh, CTs with like, you know, head, head CTs and like all this other stuff that you don't need. And you're like, ah, so like, you know, that, that basically like increases the complexity of the case. And then you may not end up operating on them, but I guarantee you, you've pretty much spent more time, you know, working on that patient self where you've had to review all this. uh, And then you, don't end up taking a lot of risk by you not doing surgery on them because, you know, say, you know what, I don't think surgery is the right thing for you. Um, whereas uh, in another case where you're doing like the electron fracture, you are operating on them. So you are undertaking a little bit more risk, which brings us to the last uh, component, which is risk. I sort of alluded to it. And that accounts for like the risk of the complications and or morbidity and mortality of a patient, uh, including the complications uh, with either additional uh, diagnostic testing. So say you send them for like a biopsy or something, or, or treatment. So like, you know, you decide to put them under to do surgery. So basically automatically like, you know, surgery um, can count as like a higher complexity, um, a higher complexity treatment. Um, or if, you know, you're an oncologist and you decide to like, you know, put them on chemotherapy, they have very high morbidity uh, with that. So, so you know, that sort of increases the risk and uh, complications. Okay. So let's say, for example, you know, we're breaking these, these down. I know you just touched on each, each of these elements uh, uh, briefly, but say, for example, we're, we're looking at the problems part of it. And, you know, these are all things that we need to make sure that we have in our note that we're mentioning. And so, you know, for a minimal problem, it's like, you know, that's going to be just one small, one small thing, you know, like, um, I don't know, some abrasion, I, just, just something small. But so say, for example, when it comes in the case if they say oh my my shoulder's been bothering me for a really long time and my my head and my knee and i mean for you know for orthopedics it's it's every joint you know it's especially a lot of, for me especially a lot of va patients will come in for their knee but then their back and neck and hip and uh, arm everything's gonna be hurting so all these different you know all these different things does that make it a more moderate complexity or you know just all these these so-called you know, i guess chronic issues yeah, for the, for the most part in, in orthopedics, I mean, we're going to play a lot more in like the level three and level four uh, regions. So, so like you mentioned, you know, level two is basically like, you know, one self-limited or minor problem. I mean, that could be something, you know, I guess maybe like, um, like sort of like an electron bursitis where you're like, yeah, you know, hey, look, look, it's an electron bursa. That's cool. Leave it alone. Um, you know, and, and that'll go away on its own. Uh, then as you start getting into like the more level threes. You can say they have like, you know, uh, stable chronic illness, which could be maybe they, they've been dealing with chronic shoulder pain or they have like, uh, you know, they woke up and have pain, which that's, you know, that counts as like an acute uncomplicated illness. Uh, or, you know, low, they have like a couple of little things they're complaining to you about, you know, like they got something on their finger and they got something on their, their elbow and they want you to look at it and that's it. And as you move into more moderate, like, you know, you basically start getting like, um, uh, the things that, that it's a little bit more uncertainty, uncertain prognosis, uh, acute illnesses with systemic symptoms, which we don't really see as much, you know, in orthopedics or like a complicated injury. So you had somebody come in with like, uh, like a trauma that was open that's already had surgery uh, on, on a particular body part. And then that sort of complicates things. So that's when you start moving more into like the moderate. Uh, and it's going to take a while for us to sort of like, you know, figure this out exactly, like, you know, kind of making sure we're, we're classifying it appropriately. Uh, and then it, very rarely, you know, we'll end up using like a level five in orthopedics. I mean, there's some people that, that do it. Uh, I think it's probably, um, you know, that's probably tends to be reserved for people like, you know, musculoskeletal oncologists, people that really are doing like, you know, some pretty, um, some pretty severe, um, se- severe, like, you know, um, things like, you know, cancers slash, you know, big reconstructions, you know, whatever. Uh, I think those, those, you know, could count as some level fives when you're seeing these patients, but in general, uh, it's going to be pretty hard to justify, you know, that big of a code um, in orthopedics, unless you happen to spend the, that much time, which, uh, 
which we can get into, you can, you can code these things based on time as well, not just uh, the medical decision-making part. I was going to say, so if you had a patient, for example, uh, comes in with shoulder pain, but then you talk to them a little bit more and you find out they had a, a total shoulder that got converted to a reverse shoulder that, 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 that ended up having glenoid loosening and ended up getting revision and then now fractured through that revision, is that something that would still be moderate or that would be more of, of a higher uh, you know, level four, or level five? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would count that for me. I'd count that at a level four now, probably. I think in the past, I probably would have counted as a level three, uh, you know, depending on whether I need to operate it on or not, because, uh, because I think that uh, it was sort of difficult to, to hit a lot of the, um, uh, to hit a lot of the uh, numbers necessary, like in terms of your exam, to be able to get a level four. Uh, people would argue one way or the other, you know, I, I've had people definitely say, you know, you can definitely build a level four for that. Uh, cause you were moving towards like, you know, talking about doing surgery, but, but it's one of those things where like, you know, for, for clarity's sake, I think it was just easier for me to bill like three. Um, and then, and then, you know, just sort of, uh, uh, alluding to what you were saying earlier, it, it also depends like, you know, kind of how much data you're reviewing. So like, you know, if you have somebody come in, uh, you don't need to get any imaging. It's pretty obvious what they got. Uh, you look at it and, uh, and you say, all right, like that's, that's like you said, an abrasion or it's nothing, or, you know, just go. You know, go throw some dirt on it or whatever. Uh, that essentially means you've done minimal data review. You haven't had to look at X-rays. You haven't had to look at labs. You haven't had to look at anything. So uh, you can basically count that as a um, as like um, a level two or like a min that counts as like a level two, like a minimum data reviewed. Now, if you start moving up into like you know uh, level three, uh, you start to to you, you start to either look at a review of prior notes from like you know outside providers. Uh, the review of like results of tests uh, or ordering tests, uh, and um, and then and then um, then there's um, I have to look at this. Uh, there's like the uh, assessment requiring an independent uh, historian. Um, so um, so that's basically um, that's basically um, I think uh, doing independent inter interpretation of these um, these tests. Okay. Uh, so when you when you move to like the level four, uh, you can basically uh, so I think if you go onto the uh, the other uh, chart that we had up, uh, uh, you start looking at um, independent like independent interpretation of a test performed by another physician or qualified healthcare professional, which uh, which is not separately uh, reported. Uh, so if you're starting to do like inter independent interpretation of tests, so if, you know you're looking at a CT scan. Uh, and you don't have a report of it or something, and I'm interpreting it. Say, all right, this clearly looks like he's got some bone loss or whatnot, and you can sort of count for that. Um, and um, and then if you call to like talk to somebody about a test with an external physician, uh, that also counts as like uh, a point. Uh, or if you're basically looking at like three prior notes, uh, looking at uh, the results of unique tests uh, slash ordering these unique tests, uh, that basically also counts. Uh, uh, for um, moderate complexity. And then as you go to, uh, if you're getting two out of those three categories where you're you know, reviewing tests, plus doing your own interpretation, plus your mind is talking to somebody outside, if you meet like two of those three categories, then you basically are able to say, all right, this is a, a this required an extensive uh, level five type uh, data reviewing interpretation. So, uh, so I mean, I think that uh, that's something to just keep in mind. Uh, because if you're doing like just a ton of review and you've talked to somebody and uh, you know the, uh, you've you spent all this time kind of reviewing things, uh, that that can pretty much count as an extensive um, um, extensive um, data review. Yeah, and I'd imagine those you know these extensive you know the ones that you build as level fives maybe these like oncology cases where you you know you're reviewing X-rays, you're looking at the MRIs, you may call a radiologist and talk to them about the MRI, you may call a radiation oncologist and talk to them, you know, that I assume that, you know, at that level of review would typically be like a level five. I assume something, you know, if we are, you know, in the clinic and we are taking a look at an x-ray and we interpret the x-ray and, and we say, oh, okay, there's, you know, medial compartment arthritis, osteophytes, et cetera, et cetera. Would that be something that would probably be more, you know, of a, of a level three data review? And and then just like you were saying before, if you're you're you know you're reviewing, well, would that be a level three or would that be a level four? If you're reviewing like a you know you're reviewing and interpreting an X-ray and coming up with a diagnosis from that. 
Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're independently interpreting the the X-ray, I mean, you could pretty much, uh, you know, based on like the new codes, you can pretty much say that 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 part of the um, that that you know your your M, your data review uh, reached like the moderate level because you're performing independent interpretation of uh, of a test. Um, so um, so you know you can basically say that uh, uh, that's pretty much starting to count in the moderate level. And I think. There's still a little bit of uh, ambiguity there, so I think we're, we're still trying to figure that out. But, but you know, like the when I'm when I'm uh, basically like reviewing, when I'm seeing X-rays like in my office, you know, they're happening so fast that sometimes you know the radiologist hasn't had a chance to review them yet, and I don't even like look at the radiology report if I'm just kind of glancing at it real quick. So like I'll do my own independent review. So, so at that point, I mean that might count as like a moderate um, med medical decision. Um, making and you know i don't know that i would necessarily count it as that for most of my patients because yeah um you know it, it becomes a, a question of like you know um it, just because it, it meets the number doesn't necessarily mean it's medically appropriate when you look at then the next component which is the risk of necessarily meeting that that threshold of being like a, a level four so if you look at the risk um like a level two has like a minimal risk of morbidity from additional testing if you go to like level three, you call it like low risk. So say somebody comes in and they have like, you know, um, cough tendinopathy and you treat them for some physical therapy. I mean, they're not likely to have like a ton of uh, additional uh, morbidity. Uh, if you start moving into like, um, you know, level four, uh, you start getting like some moderate risk. So, you know, you start getting you know, into prescription drug management, you start doing decision for minor surgery um, and, you know, minor surgery with the patient that has like some risk factors or elective major surgery, say like, you know, a rotator cuff repair or a uh, shoulder replacement uh, in a relatively straightforward patient, um, or you're having issues like, you know, they have very poor um, support structure. They have uh, uh, some issues with some of their social determinants of uh, health and like they can't get the resources that they need. You can sort of up, up level that to like a moderate risk. And then when you move to like the high risk, I mean, we're talking like, you know, uh, drug therapies requiring monitoring, like our cancer treatments, uh, elective major surgery with like identified patient or risk factors. Like this person has had, you know, has like, you know, pus pouring out of their shoulder, they're sick, they're septic, they've got a, uh, you know, uh, they got a, uh, they got a valve in and they're sitting at an INR of three and a half. Uh, and, or, or you see somebody and you have to do like a ma uh, major surgery or, hospitalize them, you know, you see somebody use a spike, they have a septic joint, send them right to the hospital. Um, you know, the, the DNR, um, there's the other part of like, you know, do not resuscitate, um, but that sort of thing because of a poor prognosis. But that's, again, not a conversation we're typically having with orthopedic surgeons, but, but, you know, things that are a little bit more serious, they, those kind of move into the uh, extensive uh, or, or more uh, high risk of morbidity from additional treatment or testing. So Dr. Garbis, would, would, I assume sending somebody, you know, treating somebody for physical therapy that I assume, you know, sending out for PT, I assume that'd be something that has, you know, minimal, minimal risk of morbidity that may be like a level two versus um, an injection, you know, you, you decide to do a shoulder injection plus physical therapy, I assume that may be a level three, is that, is that kind of correct? Yeah, right, exactly. So, and you can, again, you know, counting minimal, minimal, low, you know, the, the probably those are probably pretty comparable to some extent, but yeah, I mean, the low, you know, cortisone shots, pretty, pretty low risk. Uh, you know, I would say, you know, physical therapy is pretty minimal risk. You teach them how to do a home program is pretty minimal risk. So, uh, so I think that, you know, the risk component of it, uh, that, uh, that plays a factor as well. And, and will it be, at least for this grading system, will it be at the, when you're closing out the chart or whatever, that, that you assign like these three different categories, you just, you, you click, you know, level three, because right now at the end of, at least if you have Epic in certain places at the end, you can just click, you know, level three established level, you know, two new patient, level one, new level four, new. And I, and I assume a coder ends up going back through all that and double checking it. Do you know if, for this, it'll be for the different, you know, risk and, uh, you know, for our different three sections, if, it, if you just choose what level from each one, is that how, you know, that'll be coded or will a coder have to go through all that? Yeah, I mean, I think the way we have it right now, like at least in our EMR, um, you know, we have a, um, we have basically like a little chart now, like right by the level of service where you can like sort of look at each like line and be like, all right, I hit this, this and this. I could build this and actually, uh, you know, since sort of the start of this year and the changes, it's taken me a little bit longer, like I 
Uh, like I sort of had a system to code certain patients a certain way. And like right now I'm trying to put a little bit more thought into it to try to, um, to make sure I'm, I'm doing it correctly. Um, and that's, uh, and it's, a, I mean, I think it's a little bit new and difficult and anytime, anytime, you know, they switch it around, it sort of takes a little, little getting used to. So, um, you know, I know in, in my case, we don't really have outpatient, um, you know, nobody really goes through and checks our codes, but they'll spot check. They'll do like an audit every once in a while and say, Hey, you know what? You overcoded this case, you undercoded this case, and then you can sort of go back and look and see kind of what you did. And, uh, and that sort of, um, that can sort of help solidify, um, what, if you're doing the appropriate thing. Okay. And Dr. Garbis, I think this was a, you know, great talk, you know, great, you know, introduction to coding, billing. We definitely went over the terms in, in depth. I know as I've learned a, a lot just in this, in this short amount of time. Now, what, is there anything, you know, you definitely want people to, you know, get away after listening to this podcast episode or, you know, anything that you just definitely want to make sure that you leave the people with that they, that they know about, you know, after listening to this episode. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think the the key is, uh, you know, uh, it's this is something important, uh, and uh, and you know, while you know we we do this because you know we like what we do. At the same time, uh, you know, you also do want to get compensated for what you do, so you want to make sure you're appropriately uh, coding for your work. I think that's uh, that's important, and I think that um, that that you know, using resources either at your own institution if you have like a coder that you can work with and just have them help you through things because I to this day still mess up some surgical codes uh, that I keep forgetting that certain things are bundled and other things are not, and you know they're always there to kind of catch catch those things and uh, get and, you know kind of have my back. Uh, and then, and then basically uh, being able to like, you know, look at some basic resources for, uh, for kind of trying to start pick this, picking this up as you move into like, you know, through your chief year into fellowship and then start thinking about practice. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I totally agree with, with, you know, pretty much everything you just said there. And do you have any good sources that, you know, if somebody wants to learn more about it, or they're going, you know, I know you do sports or show, you know, mostly shoulder and elbow. Uh, but do you have any good sources for people to that you can recommend for people to look up or read out there? Uh, you know, any good websites that you recommend people check out for, uh, you know, to learn some more? Yeah, I got a couple, a couple different ones. So I think, uh, I think one is like, you know, if you're, if you're interested in learning more about, uh, about this stuff and kind of really getting in depth, I know we, we, we covered it in pretty broad strokes, but, um, and, uh, and, you know, didn't get too specific into exactly how you do this stuff, but, uh, but if you want to learn a little bit more specific, there's actually a couple like uh, things on the uh, AAOS website in terms of like the orthopedic video theater. There's this whole section. If you, if you click on like coding and reimbursement, you can get a bunch of videos and there's actually a couple of videos on there that talk, uh, that talk about the new codes and kind of what those mean and kind of how you do it. And uh, that's basically a surgeon and, uh, and a coding specialist doing it together. Um, I would say number two, uh, you can always go to like a external company uh, to like take like a, a coding course. Uh, one of the uh, one of the ones you hear uh, very commonly uh, you, uh, you know, reference in orthopedics is the Zupko uh, Z U P K O Associates. Uh, they have a, a very good coding course, uh, but the uh, but they actually will do that for residents. So I think if they do it the uh, at least they did when when I was going through like the one of the early sessions, like kind of. You know, when 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 the academy was live uh, now now that's been been a while since it's, it feels like it's been forever since it's been live uh, but uh, but you know when when the academy was live they would do uh, a coding session for like residents and fellows uh, and you can go there and just basically learn the basics uh, when you're like a, a chief uh, or a fellow to kind of start picking that stuff up as you're moving into practice and, and those are tend to be much more affordable than going out and paying for it on your own when you're an attending um, and, uh, and I think starting with those resources, uh, I think you'll get at least more than enough, uh, more than enough of what you need to know, uh, as you get started. So Dr. Garbis, I, again, thank you so much for your time. I think this was a, an excellent talk. I learned a lot, like I said, um, and I hope, you know, there are probably a lot of residents and maybe even some, you know, fellows listening to this that just, you know, definitely learned a lot about the, you know, different definitions, got a great overview of, you know, kind of some of the new things that's happening in 2021. Now at the end of our podcast, we always give our guests a way for our listeners to reach out or to follow you. If you have any social media that you would like people to follow you on or email or anything that you would like to share, uh, Dr. Garfies. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to, if you want to email me, feel free to just uh, email me directly. Uh, N-G-A-R-B-I-S and my last name at L-U-M-C dot E-D-U. Uh, and then, uh, 
if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's uh, at Nick Garbis, uh, and on Instagram, it's uh, Nicholas uh, Garbis, uh, M-D, N-I-C-K-O-L-A-S, G-A-R-B-I-S, uh, M-D. Perfect, you all. I hope you all go and um, follow Dr. Garbis. And thank you for listening to yet another episode of the Nails and Ortho Podcast. Please go and leave a review in iTunes or wherever you listen to this for the video component or the PowerPoint slides. Check out our YouTube channel and you can see all of the, um, all of pretty much the, the visuals of everything that we're talking about, all the different charts. And uh, please subscribe. And until next time.